your host, Aaron Heath. I'd like to take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 46 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 046. Well, the gun of the show for this episode is the XDM-40 from Springfield Armory. The XDM was originally released in 40 Smith & Wesson. The first 5,000 production units were lacking the word match on the chamber of the barrel. Rather than delay shipping of these guns to correct the, eh, the lack of printing, Springfield decided instead to include a certificate of authenticity. The, these very first XDM pistols also only came in the 4.5 inch barrel, and well, you know, they lacked the 4.5 stamped into the slide, but that was all of them until they released the 3.8 inch version. Now, I personally heard about this gun uh, just before it shipped. I was listening to Tom Gresham's Gun Talk radio show, and you know he mentioned you know this new XD from Springfield Armory. And since I was in an area gun store by area, I mean within 80 miles, I decided to you know ask as I was leaving if the dealer had any idea when he might get the new XD model in. His response was a few hours ago. He led me over to a case that I had passed over because normally there was nothing of interest in this case to me. And why do I say that? Well, usually it had Glocks and Jennings and, you know, guns of that nature. You know, guns that are not interesting to me in it. Well, some people might say, well, a gun dealer with Jennings in the store? Well, I, I said Jennings, but there, actually he didn't have any Jennings. It was other guns that are just boring. And I can't think of a gun more boring than a Jennings. Okay, I take that back. A Jennings really isn't boring when they blow up in your hand. Anyways, it was usually full of Glocks and other boring guns, and he opens it up and pulls out the XDM. After feeling the gun and being told to dry fire it, I took out my concealed handgun license, I, my driver's license, and my money, and I told him he sold it. Well, the reason I decided to buy it is, as far as a handgun with a factory trigger, this was one of the best I have ever felt on a striker-fired gun. Don't get me wrong, I'm a 1911 guy. It's hard for a trigger to impress me on a handgun. However, the striker fired trigger on this XDM really did. The dealer got out his 4473 and the rest of the package and, you know, I wrote down I wrote down what I needed to on the 4473. He took the 4473, wrote down my information, and rather than call it in because, well, he didn't have to. I had a Texas CHL and that exempts me from the background check. He took my money, gave me a receipt, gave me my gun, we shook hands, and we both let, I left while we were both happy. Now, since I've purchased this handgun, I really haven't re- changed anything about it other than I added a solid guide rod to it. Other than that, I've been super happy with the gun. Now, the model on this one is the XDM-9202 HCSP. That's Springfield's model number. It is being the very first, one of the first 5,000 XDMs made. It is chambered in 40 Smith & Wesson. It has a capacity of 16 plus 1. It's called a double action only trigger simply because it's a striker fired gun and that's how the ATF classifies uh, classifies them. The sights, they're drift adjustable three dot sights. The slide is a steel slide with a polymer frame. The gun weighs about 30 ounces and the MSRP at the time of this recording is $681. Well, I'm going to go ahead and run the Get Show audio, and then I'll come back and give you a few bits of an update before we go on. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Well, uh, some people have been emailing me about the Jeep, and I have to say that I'm not driving it right now. That's not because it's uh, broke down or anything. That's because it's in the body shop getting the last of the damage from the rollover repaired. It's taken a little over a month and a week to get it in, but hey, you can't gripe when, when there's a waiting list. Now that I've touched on the Jeep issue, let me say the last episode was recorded entirely on the Zoom H6. I have been very pleased with it. This episode will be recorded entirely on the H6 as well. In fact, I'm so comfortable with it that I have removed the backup recording from the H 
uh, from the old H2 in, and that device is now being dealt with as it needed to be. And the only backup I have going besides the audio on the H6 is the computer. This is going to be a very short episode this week because I have been very sick this week and I have not really had time to work on show notes. I've been sick enough that if I had had somebody to make sure the vehicle I am borrowing, and that's the reason I felt I need to mention the Jeep, if the vehicle I am borrowing had been able to be driven uh, away from the hospital or the doctor's office, I would have uh, gone to the doctor. However, when I finally got somebody to take care of the vehicle, the issues had pretty much cleared themselves up. Or not entirely, but I was on the road to recovery, and I knew what was wrong with me, simply because, well, I'm just a resilient, stubborn man. <laughs> and that's how that's how a good friend of mine that's uh, that's been in the medical profession for years described me, a resilient, stubborn man. Anyhow, you know what? Let's go on to some listener feedback, and, uh, well, you know what? I don't have it on this computer. Part of the, part of the problem with... Uh, not feeling well is you forget to do things and I forgot to add the listener feedback that I was going to do with that said I'm just going to go ahead I want to run the social media promo and or audio clip and I'm going to come back and we'll actually go straight into our topic and from there who knows the gun rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence you can like it on Facebook, you can follow it on Twitter, you can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. Now, the topic of this episode is the open carry and campus carry progress in the state Senate. This last week has seen major progress on gun rights efforts in Texas. Senate Bill 17, formerly Senate Bill 346, was passed out of committee in the Senate with an amendment requiring concealed carry on campus should campus carry pass as well. Speaking of campus carry, it too passed out of the Senate committee. Both bills passed with a straight party line vote of 7-2. to two. Now let's take a look at the situation in the House, and that is kind of a little bit of a mess because of the Speaker Joe Strauss. Well, Speaker Strauss... Uh, he he made some comments in the uh, Houston Chronicle, I believe. Yes, it's the Houston Chronicle. He basically said that. No, uh, no, 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 no. Sorry, my outline kind of breaks up right here because, well, I just didn't finish it. But anyways, he made some comments to the Houston Chronicle, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Hopefully, I can find what I'm looking for. However, the unlicensed open carry bill was sent to a committee that Pancho Navarez is the vice chair of. Essentially, this is kind of a signal to the open carry crowd, hey, I'm going to kill your bill. And in a way, I shouldn't say it because it's not funny to laugh about it. But when, but when you're, oh man, when you go out there and you take in your face approaches and basically you try to bully your way through something, well, this is the result you can expect. You can expect somebody to throw it right back in your face, just as Speaker Strauss has with the unlicensed open carry bill. Do I blame him? No. Do I blame Pancho Navarez? Should he find a way to kill the bill? No. Will it annoy me? Yes. Will it uh, simply because, well, this bill would advance gun rights, although, you know, it doesn't do it the best way. It would advance gun rights, and I hate to see it die, but I can't blame anybody for what they do on this bill simply because of the antics of the open carry advocates from open carry Tarrant County more than any other. Yes, Corey Watkins, that is a message, message directed towards you and your group. Now, the House version of campus carry has not been assigned to a committee as of this recording, and this is what I was looking for on the Houston Chronicle article. But even if Strauss takes steps to kill the bill, he should keep in mind that he has a recorded vote for the Speaker's race, And while the candidate running against him was not a good candidate to unseat him, it shows that he could face a much stronger candidate in the next session should he give Texans a reason to hold those who voted for him accountable. However, let me say that, you know, the situation with what he said in the Houston Chronicle, he basically said, and I'm thinking I may have it further down. I don't. I'll throw a link to that in the news article instead of, in the news section because while the next audio promo is running or audio clip, I will pull it in and add it back into the show notes. Anyhow, let's move on. 
Let's look at the mess that involved open carry advocates on the day of the hearing. And the first thing we need to look at is what happened with C.J. Grisham and a self-identified bodyguard for Moms Demand Action. Keep in mind the Moms Demand Action group is going to be touched on in the news segment as well. Now the bodyguard approached Grisham and took his cell phone that was being used to record the MDA interview. After regaining control of his cell phone, Grisham was reportedly assaulted again when the bodyguard basically grabbed his arm and shoved him. According to uh, Open Carry Texas, the bodyguard was armed with a concealed handgun and the Texas DPS refused to arrest the bodyguard immediately after the incident. Now then, we have the mess that is called Come and Take It. (laughs) Yeah, that's pretty much the way I feel about this one. Come and Take It recently announced Phase 4 of their brand of mental midgetry. Phase 4 is essentially concealing a handgun inside of a sock. Now, it is done in a manner so that if the sock were removed, the gun would be openly carried. They chose to call this the Glock sock. They even went so far as to have socks screen printed with the image of Glock handguns, some holstered and some not, using their Glock socks to conceal both real and toy firearms. Katie went to the Capitol to testify against licensed open carry. And I should point out this, uh, this particular come and take it, or Katie, is the gun rights group and not the podcast. Katie member, Travis, oh boy, I'm going to slaughter his last name. Kunstler, I believe. Anyhow, Katie member Travis, whatever his last name is, so I don't slaughter it again, was arrested for having a toy gun in a Glock sock and refusing to leave the Capitol after being ordered to do so by the DPS. Others were barred from carrying handguns and Glock socks and entering the Capitol. Now, there's a lot more to this story. There were accusations that the DPS claimed they were going to ban all concealed carry of guns and other things like that, although I really think somebody may have told them Hey, you have no legal authority to do that. And by somebody, I mean somebody much higher in their political structure. Once the hearing was over and the bills both passed out of committee, Katie, Open Carry Texas, and other groups who have demanded that we pass no carry unless it's unlicensed carry were busy announcing or acting like they got licensed carry through the committee. I have had people who are in the closed Facebook groups for some of these organizations tell me that, well, they intend to have... House or Senate Bill 17 amended so that it more closely resembles number 342. Now, I don't know about you, but if their bill is dead, why would they want to kill the other bill? Here's the thing. You don't know how to get your, you can't get your bill passed. No problem. How about instead of getting your bill, uh, instead of killing the other bills, how about just going ahead and passing them or helping get them passed, then come back and adjust things so that you get it in the next session. There is no need to go out and just completely have a scorched earth policy. It's my way or no way because you're going to get no way. I'm going to I'm going to pop hop into the DeLorean and the flux capacitor. We're going to go back to episodes number 2 and episode 10. That's right, episodes 2 and 10 of the Open Carry Report, which is also Gun Rights in Texas. Episodes 2 and 10 were recorded when before this podcast rebranded. Actually, it's not even 2 and 10. It's 2 and 5, I believe. Yes, episodes 2 and 5. And the guest on both of those episodes was Philip Van Cleve from the Virginia Citizens Defense League. And let me say, this is some good information on, hey, we've been hit hard. We need to get legislation passed. Rather than, rather than accept nothing, let's get what we can and go back to the well. Now, for those who don't know who Philip Van Cleve is, Philip Van Cleve is the president of the Virginia Citizens Defense League, one of the more well-known gun rights organizations at the state level. I mean, there's 50 states. Each of them have their have at least one, probably more than one, gun rights organization operating within them. And Philip Van Cleve is probably one of the most well-known outside of its own state. Open Carry Texas, Open Carry Tarrant County, and Come and Take It Texas probably are in the top five as well. However, Philip Van Cleve's organization is well known because they have gotten results. Well, let's look at some of the results they got. Well, they got concealed carry passed for Virginia, and when they got it passed, something odd happened. There was an amendment added onto the bill that kept, uh, I believe it was restaurant carry, out of the bill. They eventually went back in. And they got restaurant carry taken off the list of prohibited locations for concealed carry. Why? Well, simply put, they knew they would not get concealed carry without having a prohibition on restaurant carry. So rather than hold their breath, stomp their feet, and uh, pitch a fit until they passed out, 
they simply uh, accepted it and moved on. And then they went back and undid the damage. Note here that they did not trade anything they already earned for something they did not have. No, the compromise they made was that they would get less than what they absolutely wanted in exchange for getting most of what they wanted. This is what gun banners have been doing for years, how they have been eroding our rights. And they use the same tactics against the gun banners. Here in Texas, we got to do the same thing. Seeing as how I'm getting off topic here, I need to bring it back into play. Well, if the reports I'm getting from the closed groups on Come and Take It and Open Carry Texas are true, they intend to try and get either Senate Bill 17 adjusted so it's more like their bill, meaning unlicensed carry, where it will not pass, or they're going to try to get it adjusted where it will not pass at all. Now, if this is true, why are you doing this? Why not get licensed carry passed? That way you have at least two years of open carry that is licensed so that when you go back to the legislature in 2017, you can say, look, we passed it the last session. Nobody was killed, you know, illegally. Uh, everything, blood. there's not blood in the streets. You know, uh, dogs did not start sleeping with cats and that sort of thing. And then you say, so why... Why do we need to limit it to these people? Let's expand it. And you know what? You still make progress. You make progress every chance you can. Don't trade anything you've already gotten, but don't don't demand all or nothing either. Anyhow, I'm going to, because I'm not feeling too hot, I'm going to run the audio clip. And after the audio clip is run, I am probably going to pause it. Then I'll come back. And when I come back, we're going to hit the news segment where, well, we're going to talk about Speaker Strauss that I had intended to put in the main body of the article or this. We're going to talk about MDA a little bit more, and we're going to talk about, a, well, we're going to talk a little bit about gun safety. With that said, let's roll to the contact info. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. Speaker Strauss has telegraphed his hostility to campus carry in an interview with the Houston Chronicle. He is quoted as saying, I would caution anyone who intends to ignore Admiral McRaven when you're talking about arms and ammunition. Now, the problem with Admiral McRaven's position, and Admiral McRaven is the chancellor of the University of Texas. The problem with this position is that the military, along with its retirees, have an ingrained distrust of anyone possessing arms and ammunition. And by its uh, by the military and its trustees, I mean the officers. The enlisted men tend to be a little more trusting of people with arms and ammunition simply because they've had to deal with people holding arms and ammunition. Hmm. I mean, after all, the military leadership doesn't even trust military personnel with arms and ammunition outside of combat unless they are forced to. I don't know about you, but if you've ever been on a military base, and I've gone to Fort Hood. Just as you go on to Fort Hood, you go to a checkpoint. The checkpoint is not manned by military personnel. It is manned by civilian law enforcement. And by civilian law enforcement, I mean they're pretty much rent cops but by but they're hired by the federal government. I don't know if they actually carry a Texas law enforcement uh, officer's uh, certification or not in Texas. I am certain they have to, but with it being a military operation, you never can tell. However, these are not military personnel. They are civilians. You would think the military would trust its own people to protect its own bases, even on its home soil. However, it does not. From the Texas Firearms Coalition website, we have a story titled False Testimony by President of Texas Chapter of Moms Demand Action. Well, the title pretty much sums it up. Her testimony was under oath that there is no data set of about or no data set available about how responsible Texas gun owner or Texas CHL holders are. Well, the problem with that is the Texas DPS is required by law to maintain and publish that data the very data that she claims is unavailable and locked down. I would also like to point out that it would not surprise me if everybody sitting there on the Senate committee did not have that data in front of them because, well, when you're testifying about licensed open carry and how how well-behaved Texas license holders are, 
you kind of provide that data for the people that you're going to, I don't know, be testifying to. So I'm going to be willing to bet that the TSRA and the NRA reps kind of had that data in front of the Senate committee if the Senate committee didn't go out and get it themselves. Needless to say, the false testimony could come back to bite them. I don't know. And our final news story, and I'm going to wrap this episode up real quick because, well, like I said, I'm not feeling well. But our final news story is in the miscellaneous category where a World War II reenactor playing the role of a German was injured when he received a deep graze from live ammunition. It is unclear how live ammunition came to be used and an investigation is underway. I would like to point out that blanks can be as dangerous as live ammunition. In fact, a Google search for actor killed by blanks returns a number of results. I was looking for an article about an actor in the 80s, but then I saw pages upon pages upon pages. So basically, yeah, there's results. And blanks are dangerous. That's why you that's why we have the four rules of gun safety. And they apply even when you have blanks. Obviously, these people are doing something that in my opinion, is not the brightest thing to do with uh, real ammunition and real weapons. Well, I'm going to hit the sign off for this episode. And before I do, let me say that seeing as how this episode was a Texas legislative update in and of itself, there won't be one at the end. Well, let me say thank you and please carry responsibly. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly.